we are getting to the first two speakers, which I will again shortly introduce. The first of our two talks will be from Polina Ponomarenko, um, who was studying first in Berlin, sports science, uh, and working there as a licensed yoga teacher, kind of discovering her interest, her passion for Eastern and Western philosophy, which led her to an apprenticeship in Costa Rica, Costa Rica with a, a neo-shaman. Um, after which she decided to come to Bern to study psychology to Switzerland because of the psychedelic research that was going on and that she by then already was interested in. By now she's in the last semester um, and one of the co-founders of the Alt Forum as well as member of Probe, which also Alexis had tried to put into context right now. And um, her first research uh, grounded research experience was in the Hasler Lab in Fribourg, uh, where she also published one of her first art articles a couple of months ago, which she will also be talking about today, which is the therapeutic factors of psychedelic assisted group therapy. That being said, I'm very happy to welcome Polina, not only a good researcher, but also a good friend. Please, Polina, stage is yours. Thank you, Philip. Um, thank you. I'm a little bit shy to speak uh, to you uh, in front of you all, but I'll try my best um, today. Okay. Um, today I would like to talk to you about psychedelic assisted group psychotherapy, which um, is an article that I could recently publish with, um, with the collaboration of my professor um, Dr. Gregor Hasler, well, and also with my partner Federico Serranoli, with my friend Abigail Calder, and with a very important guide for all of us here, um, Dr. Peter Oehn. But before we get into the details of uh, my presentation, I would like to let you know that I will not be um, answering questions in the end of my talk. So I would like to encourage you, if you have questions, just raise your hand and um, we can get into a, um, an, into a conversation. So to practice this, uh, the first thing I would like to ask you actually, so by raising your hand, um, who here would be confident enough to tell the exact, the exact difference between psychedelic therapy, psychedelic assisted psychotherapy, and psycholytic therapy? Just by raising your hand. Oh wow, <laughs> so many. No, but this is great actually, this is awesome because um, this is very good to know for me um, since this is exactly uh, the same question I faced when I started my research in PAGP. So um, to spare you basically, uh, to spare you the details of my struggle to find a satisfying answer straight away in the literature because every, everybody seemed to, uh, to write a different, uh, yeah, to use different names for basically maybe the same thing yeah um, so I created wait yeah I created this diagram for you here um, uh, to show you uh, to show you what um, so I would like to yeah I would like to show you this diagram I created in order to see in which category PAGP actually falls on the global spectrum of psychedelic use and applied research so as you can see, research with the actual physical handling of, uh, of psychedelic substances, by which, for example, I exclude philosophical or anthropological research, so this sort of applied research falls into the branch of psychopharmacological research, which can be done on cells, on animals, or in humans. In the human category, here on the right, we can distinguish between so-called preclinical studies on healthy participants, which uh, could, for example, be pharmacological in nature, where they, this is what they do in Basel normally, where they take your blood, they measure the drug concentration during the experience, or they could be neuroscientific, which is something that is done in the University of Fribourg, where they measure your brain during the experience. So, okay. Then we also have clinical studies. And um, so these are done on populations with psychiatric, uh, with people with psychiatric or psychological disorders. 
And here, as you can see in orange and in red, I found a very clear distinction between psychedelic therapy and psychedelic assisted psychotherapy. So the distinction was actually, was actually a belief. So the distinction was that the belief that in psychedelic therapy, psychedelics on their own can lead to an improvement in the disorder without psychotherapy as an accompanying instrument. This means that in psychedelic therapy studies, in the research, for example, patients undergo only very limited amount of uh, preparation and integration sessions, meaning only, maybe only one or two at max. In this way, psychedelic therapy is actually very similar to, um, to the studies done on healthy participants, if you think about uh, the way they structure the actual research. So even though this model is actually quite popular nowadays, uh, some researchers have argued that this often leads to sort of confusion within and especially with naive patients or even healthy participants who don't have proper support and understanding of these experiences in their surroundings, in their family and friends. So, um, of course, some of the researchers are, um, are sort of overgoing this uh, little problem uh, by not including naive patients, not including naive participants, so just including uh, participants who already have experience with psychedelics. However, there we are missing a whole population group, right? So just to give you an example in this, uh, in the US it has already been documented that this has led to some non-professionally assisted psychedelic integration groups specifically for, the stud for research study participants. Okay, so just to give you my personal opinion on this, um, I am sure that these groups are incredibly helpful and I'm very grateful that they exist. Um, however, I'm making this example here only because to me, this alone is enough evidence that there is clearly a need for interpersonal exchange, like peer exchange, after such a big and potentially life-changing psychedelic experience. Thank you. <laughs> So with this, I, I, I close my personal opinion, but <laughs> yeah. Um, so this all leads me then to talk to you about the big red psychedelic assisted psychotherapy realm. Let's put it like this. And here the word assisted is actually the key word to understanding because what they mean, what they generally mean by this in the literature is the term that this is normal ongoing talking psychotherapy weekly or bi-weekly or however you want to do it accompanied by occasional psychedelic sessions. And what I exactly mean by this occasional, uh, I'm going to get into the details of it a little bit later. Any questions so far? <laughs> yes? They created these groups by themselves because they felt the need to um, I will get into the details also uh, of how these groups were created, but this, so this um, diagram I created myself just to to give myself a sort of um, an overview of how how I see that this works normally, but I will also, so for, for example in the red here you can see like different kinds of names and I will get into the names of it later. The, ah, the integration groups. Um, I don't actually know how exactly they got created, but I read this in a research paper from Norani, and uh, he just mentioned it that they were existing. Yeah. Okay. Um, so. So within the PAP realm, right, and the big red one, um, there are, of, cor of course, um, also different uh, therapeutic schools and actions. So for lack of time, here I would like to only introduce the two major historical directions. On the one side, here on the left, we have psychedelic assisted psychotherapy or psychedelic assisted therapy, which are nowadays mostly used synonymously. And they refer to the US American humanistic transcendental method of very high dosages of psychedelics, eye shades, uh, headphones, this kind of typical uh, thing that we also see in this picture there, and um, pure introspection during the session with little to no contact to others during the actual experience. The goal here is to create, uh, to ensure so-called peak experiences or ego dissolutions or similar phenomena like that. On the other side, we have psycholytic therapy, which comes more out of a European tradition and is rooted in psychodynamic methods. 
Here, the clinician typically use small to medium doses and more interaction with the therapist during the session. The primary goal, he goal here is to uh, explore difficult memories and to begin to understand them from a new, more open perspective, thereby uncovering also inner functioning, functionings of the mind. Um, so now, well, when all of this research was flourishing in the, in the mid 20th century, those two schools were very distinct from each other, and not just geographically, but also philosophically, as you can see. However, um, nowadays there is a tendency to, to merge these two methods, sort of, and when you read research papers on this, um, you will see that a lot of researchers will analyze the effects of peak experiences together in the same sample, in the same population group, um, with outcomes of uh, psycholytic therapy. And also, since most of the research is English-speaking, the word PAP is probably the most common one in use uh, right now internationally. However, in some circles, as you will see a little bit later on, the term psycholytic is also still in use. Mm, questions? No. <laughs> okay. So, um, going back to our diagram, you can see here that PAGP, in the way I use this term, uh, could actually be used in both of these types of schools, so PAP or psycholytic therapy, and it is basically only because yeah, it is basically only referring to the group setting being used in PAP in one way or another, and you will, as you will later on see, um, gr the group setting can be used in very different ways. So. Yeah, later on I will be showing you a couple of actual concrete examples of uh, group therapy on psychedelics, but before that, um, I thought maybe some of you have been wondering, like, why, why do group therapy at all? Like, that doesn't sound very safe to me, or, you know, normally we would see, like, one, um, one patient uh, with two therapists uh, there, like, that sounds way more safe. And if this is the case, if you've been wondering this, then um, let's have a look at what individual PAP versus PAGP could actually offer on a global uh, scale of, apply of applied research. So physical safety in both of these are ensured, same as a profound experience, and I will also later explain to you how a profound experience is ensured in PAGP as well. There is also integration with a the therapist, which is important, and in both, um, yeah, um, is there in both um, schools. There is, of course, the difference between the interpersonal peer reflection, which is not uh, automatically given in individual uh, PAP, but it is definitely given in PAGP. The amount of research is, of course, uh, an immense, as you will. I will also show you um, later on. Uh, the amount of research that, be, that has been published on PAGP, which is really not a lot. Um, however, the clinicians have um, often stated that during, uh, even in research papers, that individual PAP is often quite laborious. If you um, think about the fact that there is two therapists there for at least eight hours, um, it can be quite challenging. And it's also, of course, a lot more expensive for the actual patient, if you think about it. Group therapy, you could reduce the cost um, for each patient, and it would be way more cost effective. So now, knowing all of this, Let's get into some actual existing PAGP models that are being used right now on this globe. Uh, first of all, we have to understand that the group setting is generally rooted in social, religious, or ritualistic psychedelic consumption in various cultures around the globe. However, it is important to uh, mention here that the only, basically the only reliable similarity between PAGP and uh, group ceremonies is the fact that they are both conducted in groups. So, and this is because the purposes of ritualistic consumption of these substances has often very little to do with psychotherapy as we know it here in the global west, in the, uh, in the, yeah, in the west, in the global north, or however you would like to call it. However, nowadays, uh, with the established industry of drug tourism, and especially ayahuasca tourism, in countries like Peru, Colombia, Costa Rica as well, uh, and in this case, Canada, uh, some combinations of ritualistic and therapeutic use have also been established. So here, um, there was actually one research study that could 
uh, that actually was created under the name of Ayahuasca Assisted Therapy for Substance Addiction. This study was conducted in a retreat center in Canada and was following 12 participants of a rural Aboriginal population. The results of this uh, study were actually, I find them very promising since six months, only like six months after only one single ayahuasca uh, ritualistic session, cocaine use declined significantly, alcohol and tobacco use also declined, and cannabis and opiate use were the only ones that did not decline. I will later on, be, when I will be talking about the factors, I will also be referring basically to all of the existing PAGP models um, as well. So just to give you an idea why I'm really presenting them here like that. So outside of uh, the research or the ritualistic setting, I also found one clinic in the US which has been using ketamine-assisted group therapy since 2016, or CAP as they would like to call it. Their approach uh, is very different. It uses small, homogenous groups around four to eight people. Homogenous here means, uh, for example, patients with only depression or patients with only PTSD or with only cancer-related distress. And usually there is one to two therapists present. Patients normally come once a month uh, for, every, um, for four months or every three months for a year. And then they receive oral or intramuscular dosing, which gradually increases with every single session. But, however, well, since this, this is not actually uh, research, uh, so we cannot really say how effective this type of therapy really is. However, I still find it very interesting just to have this type of setting to show you guys that this also exists. Another example of uh, PAGP that I would like to show you is psilocybin assisted group therapy, which was actually here part of a very large research project in the US using the PAGP model. In this study, there were three groups of six gay identified male participants over 50 years old with a HIV diagnosis and moderate to severe dem demoralization. Demoralization means that it, this was a very severe feeling of hopelessness that they had around their diagnosis. They were selected into the program, and the program consisted of, so in the beginning you had four um, group therapy sessions, then one individual psilocybin session with two therapists present, which is actually, uh, you would call it more individual PAP rather than PAGP. Uh, one day after you had um, one individual uh, integration session, and the following weeks you had more group therapy sessions in the same groups. The results of this study were very, very positive with significant improvements um, in pretty much, uh, in, of demoralization in pretty much all of the patients. And I will get into the exact outcomes of this uh, study a little bit later on. Uh, because first, I wanted to introduce to you one existing PAGP model, which uh, you could almost call traditional here in Switzerland. <laughs> uh, because it has been practiced since the 80s by the members of the Swiss Medical Society for Psycholytic Therapy. In total, right now, there have been two uh, experimental studies published on this method. So here, I would only be talking about the actual therapeutic procedure more than about the different research uh, variables. As you can see in this picture, or maybe it's a little bit blurry, uh, or maybe you, you don't actually see it, um, but this type of therapy is conducted in open heterogeneous groups with different psychological disorders, uh, which, uh, for example, PD, uh, PTSD, 64%, depression, uh, anxiety disorders, and they're all grouped together in one group. And the only uh, real thing that they have in common is that they are considered to be treatment resistant, which means that multiple treatments have been tried on them before without success. So um, the substances are also distributed quite differently for each patient all together in one session. There is LSD or MDMA in medium to high dosages. The groups are very large for, uh, with up to 13 patients and up to three accompanying therapists and there is also a great variety in between the groups. So the psychedelic uh, therapy in general is, um, uh, well, the, the therapy sessions are usually spaced out around three and a half months apart with uh, three to ten individual psychotherapy sessions in between. So this is sort of like the exact opposite of the psilocybin study that we saw just before, because you have, if you imagine, uh, the therapists follow um, 
the patients individually, weekly or biweekly, and then every three and a half months they group them all together and they uh, make a, um, a psychedelic session. This is, as you can see, like a long-term therapy. So if you get a, for example, if you get a permission for four or five or six uh, um, different psychedelic sessions, then um, if they're all three and a half months apart, this is going to be at least a year or more. For the psychedelic session, they use normally a so-called three-day format, which is Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So you imagine uh, Friday night, the patients arrive, they get to know each other since many, maybe they don't know each other. Um, uh, there is a preparation session and then Saturday morning the, there's a sort of like the dozing day and then on Sunday there is well, uh, Saturday night and then on Sunday again uh, you have an integration session and then the patients can go home. Uh, since we are here talking about psychedelics, I thought the Saturday one is the most important one to talk about. Uh, Saturdays are usually started at 10 a.m. It lasts the whole day. But if you imagine, um, all these patients have different dosages, different substances. Some of their trips will last longer than others. So, and this is a very important point I would like to address on how they actually provide this profound psychedelic experience even in the group. And it's because the, usually around about the first five hours of this experience are done in individual silence. So you can imagine here that these patients are lying on the ground with their blankets, eyes closed, um, and they don't speak to each other, which really ensures uh, a deep introspective experience. After these five hours, there can maybe be quiet music or a little bit more interaction within the group or with the therapists. So, um, yes? Uh, I had a question. How, how does it work from a legal uh, liability uh, perspective? Are there risks uh, on the, the individual themselves or is it the organization that bears the risk if something was wrong when doing the therapy? Well, um, I don't know the exact um, um, the exact legality of this, but I would it would seem to me that this is a a, a psychedelic uh, well this is a therapy. So just as in any other therapy, uh, there would be the therapist who would be responsible for the safety. Yeah. Yes. Um, just on the profound experience, can you say a little more about what you mean by um, profound and why you identify it with? Well, I would say profundity uh, is connected to introspection in a way that there is uh, the um, the interaction is minimized, so you have more time to think about yourself or uh, to, to experience the actual drug effects without uh, interruptions from the outside. So that would, I guess this is how from the outside you would try to ensure a profound experience as, uh, a profound experience as much as possible. Of course you cannot 100% guarantee that everybody will have a profound experience, that's true. But that's also true in individual psychedelic therapy. Just quickly, uh, if you could wait for us bringing you the microphone so we can record the questions. Oh. Thanks. Awesome, thank you. Um, so on the previous slide you were talking about uh, this, this demoralization and uh, I was wondering whether there's some research already published on how like single person sessions are affecting demoralizations. So is there a difference between the group aspect and the single person or is it just like a general effect of psychedelics? Because it's a new term for me, this demoralization. This is a very good question. Of course, here in my literature research, I was mostly focused on the group setting, which is why I didn't actually look into the individual setting so much. Um, but to my knowledge, uh, there has only been one single paper published actually comparing individual versus group therapy, and this was done in Switzerland. This was not, so it was done with this therapy model and demoralization was not a specific factor there. But. Thank you. Um, so I have more of a technical um, question. How do you know which drug was attributed to which type of patient? Like they get prescribed it individually. So yeah, 
they they know what they're going to be receiving. <laughs> yeah, but like uh, you don't decide, okay, uh, the PTSD group will receive this type of drug and the depression one will receive more MDMA. I, well, here I'm also not quite sure on how this exactly would work, but um, maybe this is something that the therapist would yeah. speak about with the patient and then decide together or, um, yeah, or the BAG, or, um, mm. I don't know. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Um, just a precision, so I work as psychedelic therapist legally in Switzerland in an hospital in Geneva, and basically we ask for uh, uh, the BAG, an authorization for a given patient, for a given um, diagnostic, and if we get it, it lasts for one year for a given substance. So that patient will have the right to do psychedelic therapy for one year with a specific substance, psychedelic substance. So in the end, uh, this process is made by the therapist, the psychiatrist that is in charge of that patient that gets this authorization from the Federal Office of Public Health. Okay, maybe I can go on. Um, or maybe one last question over there. Um, thank you. Quick question about a slide that we saw earlier when you were comparing the individual group um, therapies and the group therapies. Um, I, f I believe it was written that there were some tasks that people would do in the group. Yes. Um, could you give some examples of tasks that they do? Well, for example, one therapist could be, be more in charge of the music and another therapist would, could, uh, could more look um, for specific needs of any given specific patient. Okay, thank you. Okay, so in total, just summarizing, we have seen uh, very different PAGP examples here. Uh, we have seen open groups, uh, so people uh, don't know each other when they come into the therapy, versus closed groups where people do know each other. We have seen homogeneous uh, groups of, uh, sim of similar diagnosis, heterogeneous groups with different diagnosis. This uh, PAGP model often starts... Oop, often starts with individual sessions, but of course not, al not always, like in the psilocybin group. Um, we, there is a very big variety of psychedelic experiences uh, due to substances, doses, uh, context, variety, right? And we haven't even here gotten into the actual psychotherapeutic methods that are being used in this therapy. So all in all, I would say this uh, seems a little bit messy. <laughs> Um, however, I, I did group all of these together under one name of PAGP because uh, basically I was wondering, this was my personal curiosity of how do we know that this therapy actually works or in the, in the exact terminology that we would use in psychotherapy research is what are the therapeutic factors leading to PAGP being a successful therapy model. So um, just one moment. Sorry. Tee, 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 tee. No. Okay. So for this, uh, my professor, so Dr. Krego Hasla, nudged me a little bit to read more about one of the most famous practitioners of group therapy today, who is called Dr. Irvin Yalom. And fun fact about him, I recently read his autobiography, and Irvin actually experienced, uh, actually experimented in his youth with LSD as well. Um, and his very first publication that he ever created was on LSD and psychosis, after which he didn't continue in this direction. He went more into group therapy, but I just found it very cool <laughs> that I knew about it after I, I wrote, an wrote an article on him. So in 1995, this psychiatrist first published a manual specifically for group therapy, where he described 11 group therapeutic factors, which you can see here. And of course, this is a very long and extensive and very detailed list, but basically these 11 uh, therapeutic factors are meant to describe why group therapy works in a very general manner if you're not distinguishing between the different psychotherapeutic schools. So. Um, yeah, so here, for, so for my personal research project that I had, uh, I basically created a narrative synthesis of existing literature um, that I could find of any studies relevant to PAGP or its neurobiological underpinnings. 
And I took the 11 group therapeutic factors as a base of structure. And I basically, yeah, so I wanted to find out what, in which, um, yeah, for each factor, what can I find here that is relevant for specifically PAGP? So the first two factors um, should usually be established right in the beginning of the group therapy process and then strengthened, and then strengthened throughout the progress. So the first thing we can ask here is how can a patient develop hope in uh, psychedelic assisted group psychotherapy? First of all, we have to uh, remember that a lot of these patients have undergone very different uh, treatment models before, and we can tell them that this is not just another pharmacotherapy, but it has social experiences included in them, and also uh, we've seen that psychedelic experiences can reliably, uh, or at least in some research we have been seeing, that they can reliably produce a meaningful experience. So then also, of course, throughout the process, uh, the participants can see the success of other group members and get hope from that as well. Universality here means um, like normally when you are diagnosed with a psychiatric uh, disorder, very often you will have a feeling of universality, which is sort of like a feeling of not being included in the world, um, being outside, not feeling understood. And this is something that group therapy tackles from the very beginning, since uh, there is a lot of interpersonal exchange and they realize, ha, huh, I'm not the only one, right? So in, so in PAGP, this factor of reducing universality can actually, can actually be enhanced also by psychedelics, since psychedelics uh, reliably produce an experience of unity or uh, uh, a stepping into the mind at large, as Aldous Huxley would call it, by, for example, ego dissolution or egolesis, which is a, a more a dynamic uh, term uh, of, of, uh, of a small ego dissolution or a partial ego dissolution. Yeah. Uh, and of course, uh, psychedelics reliably produce a reduction of self-focus, which can also be very useful here. Then we have imparting information, and as in any type of therapy, imparting information basically means uh, that the therapist would do general psychoeducation uh, for their patient. In the group, this can actually also, so in specifically PAGP groups, this can actually be enhanced in the psychedelic sessions themselves, since there is not only evidence-based psychotherapy um, that is being used there, but also consensual and light physical touch, for example. There can also be some humming, singing, or reading poems that have a, um, uh, that have a, yeah, um, some sort of meaning behind them. And there's, of course, also a lot of support from other group members, which brings me a little bit to also the, uh, alt so the next factor, which is altruism, since uh, it has been shown that in group therapy in general, patients don't only benefit from uh, receiving help, but also from giving help themselves. So um, psychedelics in this way can actually also enhance this factor by, um, since there has been research published that shows that here, MDMA specifically, actually, uh, MDMA increases pro-social behavior not only in humans, but also reliably in animals. And, of course, in, in humans, uh, from self-experiences, also the feeling of sociability. This effect is uh, particularly enhanced when the people already know each other rather than them being strangers. So. Um, this actually speaks, I guess, to more uh, having closed groups rather than open groups. Uh, and this effect is also more prominent when there is low altruism at baseline, which you can hypothesize that in many psychiatric conditions that would be the case. However, here I would wanted to uh, show you a specific uh, research that has been done by Katrin Prela. Um, uh, from a social value orientation test, uh, where basically they uh, were given uh, a choice between two different actions. One would be considered a little bit more pro-social or altruistic. And these uh, participants here, in this case healthy participants, were given MDMA. And it could, it, it, the, well, the test showed that uh, the population group with low altruism at baseline, which here uh, were particularly the men, um, <laughs> had a very uh, significant increase of altruism when being on MDMA. So uh, then we go on with the factors, uh, and there is something that Irvin Yalom called the corrective recapitulation of the primary family group, 
which goes by the psychoanalytic notion that uh, that people with a psychiatric disorder will have difficult uh, childhood experiences that they have to um, uh, sort of remember and uh, go into and explore um, in the in the process of therapy. So in the group, this. Uh, uh, so in any group therapy, this can actually be enhanced, and Irvin Yalom called the group the social, the sort of like a social microcosm where people, uh, uh, patients can explore uh, different types of relationships that sh relationships that they had um, in a more safe manner, uh, accompanied by the therapist. So here, the group serves as a model. However, in PAGP specifically, this effect can also be enhanced uh, potentially by the fact that psychedelics uh, have been shown to. Uh, reliably improve autobiographical memory, increase vividness and intensity of uh, memories of patients. Um, so basically, these uh, uh, people can then remember their experiences even better. And here, I would also like to point out to, a, uh, to an analogy that my uh, professor Gregor Hasler um, uh, uses often, which is the helioscope effect. So not only can these people remember these experiences of their childhood better, but they can also, uh, similar to a helioscope, if you know what this is, this is a sort of like a telescope, but for the sun. So normally, if you watch the sun with your bare eye, your eyes would hurt uh, or it, uh, it would not be good. However, with the helioscope, you can actually, as in this picture, you can see the sun, you can have a look at it for a longer period of time. It does hurt your eyes to have a look at it. So in this way, uh, it's also with the uh, memories that you have. So psychedelics not only improve the memory, but may also potentially um, make sure that you are able to, to experience these memories without you getting hurt as much from them. So then we have uh, another factor, which is called the development of socialization techniques, which is uh, practiced very, uh, uh, like, which is practiced a lot in any group therapy by, diff for example, um, role plays or different kinds of exercises that can be done in the group. And um, I'm making the hypothesis here that PAGP, that in PAGP, socialization techniques uh, can actually be practiced more easily, because. Um, in the psychedelic, um, so in combination with psychedelics, there is uh, an inc there has been shown. So this is actually these are the outcomes also of um, a specific PAGP. Uh, um, study, there, there was an increase of uh, spontaneous speech, an increase of uh, more emotional disclosure. It was just easier to talk about your own personal emotions. Uh, there is a reduce of uh, interpersonal defensiveness, which is very important also in interpersonal um, communication. There is a decreased um, sensitivity of social exclusion, and this has been also shown by Katrin Prella in one of her um, uh, one of her studies where she uh, took the famous cyberball experiment, which if you don't know, this is um, a computer game that you're playing where the ball gets tossed uh, from you to other people and you can toss the ball back and then at some point the ball stops getting tossed to you. And normally uh, there would always automatically, if you're like sober, right, there would be a sort of uh, feeling a little bit of social exclusion. However, on psychedelics, um, and I think this was MDMA here, here as well, um, there was a, a decreased sensi sensitivity to social exclusion. And so, uh, it, this of course is all uh, hypothetical. I'm just, so for me, this in this um, narrative synthesis, I'm just seeing the literature and then deducing conclusions here that could actually, that could potentially be helping also in PHP. So that none of this is, is like a fact here, but yeah. Um, then, uh, if we go on to, there is a, another factor that Irvin Yalom called, which is imitative behavior. So, when patients start to imitate each other is in their patterns, in their behaviors. And here I would like to read you a quote from, some, uh, from two PAGP therapists that are conducting psilocybin therapy. And it is, I'm reading, um, within the direct experience, how many times have we seen the release of someone in the group, possibly even at a distance, that has an impact on others within the group with feeling okay to just let it go? 
We have instances where someone's outbursts or emotional release will trigger someone else's. So this goes to show you here that they see this as a beneficial factor that uh, maybe, especially for people who are struggling with um, with the emotional release on a psychedelic experience, to see the emotional release happening with other people can actually also help them in the sort of imitative behavior uh, to trigger it as well. Then there is interpersonal learning that happens more towards the end um, when the social microcosm of the group therapy is already sort of established. And here I would like to uh, tell you a little bit more detailed of the outcomes of this psilocybin PAGP study with the demoralized HIV patients. Uh, so in semi-structured interviews, um, there was three months after the psychedelic intervention, there was a reduction in attachment, in attachment anxiety. There was also an increased ability to recognize maladaptive patterns from the past. There was uh, an overcoming of previous emotional boundaries. And uh, the therapy treatment also helped interact and feel connected with other group members and their primary family group back at home. So um, the effect was not only in just in the group, but also outside of the group. Um, However, one thing I also have to point out here, uh, since of course I'm making the sound very idealistic a little bit, oh, PAGP can solve all the problems, but of course that's not, uh, that's not the case. And um, because, for example, processing shame and especially sexual trauma as um, in this group sh uh, was shown to be more difficult in group, and maybe it needs a little bit more support or a little bit different support in individual sessions. So here I've also stated a lot of things uh, that actually go together with group cohesion, right? To feel connected to other group members. And here um, I wanted to tell you uh, what um, uh, Peter Gassa once uh, wrote in one of his articles was that contact outside of the PAGP group is actually being desired. So if you think about today's day and age where we are often very isolated, where we use social media to, to find some sort of uh, connection or whatever here, um, maybe in a, in a potential group setting, it is actually uh, promoted to establish real friendships that go outside of that therapy. Uh, but, of course, uh, conflicts can also arise in, uh, in, in this type of group, and especially if you have, a, if you think about the, the, in the Swiss model, right? So you have uh, uh, heterogeneous open groups with different kinds of people. There is bound to be conflicts arising, right? And uh, here Peter Gass has stated that conflicts arise specific, uh, very often when participants start to communicate inauthentically and hide their feelings. This is most often, like the most often reason for conflicts. Um, we, and I really liked how he stated that when he wrote this, he also uh, wrote about how to overcome this and how to prevent this from happening. And it is to, to put together uh, newcomers uh, to this type of therapy together with people who are already very experienced, because then the people who are very experienced can act as role models to, um, to open up the authentic communication and uh, to open up emotionally to show also uh, the others on, on how to do it, basically. Um, then we come to our last uh, two uh, therapeutic factors, which are uh, catharsis and existential factors. So catharsis is a very big one, I guess, in psychedelic therapy. Um, since psychedelics, right from the beginning of research, have, uh, have been described to reliably uh, amplify affectivity. And this effect has been shown in individual psychotherapy with it, but also with group psychotherapy with it. In general, they are um, amplifying affectivity. So there is also this notion that since there is this boom and a lot of patients coming into this therapy all are already aware of psychedelics and aware of this cathartic effect that they may cause, that there is very high expectations involved and also a fear of losing control. Oh, I could never do this in front of a group because I would fear to lose control over myself in front. And here, uh, what I really uh, liked, one passage that Robin Carhart Harris wrote in one of his articles was that the experience of autonomy is actually equally important to have a catharsis uh, during a psychedelic experience uh, just as much as um, 
as letting it go and uh, being there in the moment. Because personal control, or the way he called it actually, uh, it being a trait of conscientiousness, is equally crucial to have a catharsis. So no, because no surrender, no control. Uh, because just surrender with no control, and this is something that Peter Un also described to me, uh, is often uh, one of the primary causes of having a quote-unquote bad trip. So coming to the existential factors that are the most important ones, right, like towards the end of the therapy, where it's like, okay, how do I move on? What is life uh, being in general? Um, so it has been shown that PAP is actually often treated in existential distress and hopelessness. So similar to the questions that have been asked before, um, I didn't read them uh, thoroughly, but I just saw that they, they do exist and uh, treating uh, hopelessness and death anxiety uh, with psychedelics seems to be um, seems to be a, um, a popular thing uh, because of the hypothesis, uh, hypothesis to um, reduce the fear of death by forcing confrontation with mortality, for example, through an ego dissolution or an egolysis or similar phenomena. Um, so here uh, I'm again presenting some of the uh, outcomes that have been um, written down by the psilocybin uh, demoralized HIV patients uh, research group there was a so in this patient group there was uh, there has been found uh, nor in like a change between trauma orientation towards growth orientation there was a stronger self compassion and inner self inner sense of security there was more hope more empowerment and um, and so on. And so I think, uh, I know I just briefly jumped over all of these factors. I think in, in the article, there's it's all described way more in detail. Uh, and if you're interested, you're very welcome to read it as well. Um, so um, we have seen, of course, uh, here a lot of, uh, a lot of the very positive side of uh, PAGP. And, um, here, uh, so towards the end of this presentation, I would like to also show you, of course, the challenges that um, that go with it and that have been documented already. So first of all, there is a rigid structure. Uh, if you imagine, for example, in this WISP model, where it's uh, where you have all these different patients undergoing different experiences, having different uh, disorders. Um, a, a more rigid schedule is simply important to to have. You cannot you cannot be as individual as an individual. Um, you cannot uh, how do you say uh, uh, take care of the patient uh, in an individual manner as you would do an individual PAP, right? So, for example, uh, when are you allowed to speak? When are you when have uh, when can you when should you be silent? just things like that. Then um, there's also the coordination of substance dose and effect, which I just mentioned. Um, there's a uh, way bigger chance of having interference in the group. Imagine you're still there after five hours, you want your, your introspective experience, you don't want to have music or anything like that, but uh, the guy next to you is, uh, is jumping up and down and wants to move and, uh, you know, <laughs> you, <laughs> that, that could also lead to interference, of course. Um, there is also, as we've seen before with the sexual trauma, there is difficulty in opening up about certain topics, and maybe this, which is, which, you know, a proposition here would have, uh, sh would be to have a, a sort of in between where you have some of the sessions in individual, some of the sessions being in group, right? Um, there is also the potential of uh, learning maladaptive patterns. So imagine. Um, uh, some of the people in your group have a particular way of interpreting the psychedelic experience that you didn't necessarily have before, but then you are, through the imitative behavior, you're also getting influenced by that, and maybe uh, this is all not so uh, beneficial to you after all. And this has also actually, Peter Gasser in one of his articles talked about this, that this can happen, and it is then the responsibility of the therapist to jump in and uh, say, you know, look, uh, we're all here to learn, right? So, uh, and lastly, uh, in my presentation, I would like to tell you also that PAGP is in no way should be considered to be um, 
simply a spiritual ritual. And here uh, I would like to finish with a quote uh, from Anne Mithofer, who is a, uh, an MDMA therapist in the US, and she said it very beautifully, which is, um, Therapists are not required to understand or even have an opinion about the ontological status of these experiences, but it is essential that they accept them as real and important aspects of the participant's experience and convey respect for and openness toward the, ex the participant's own view of them without dismissing or pathologizing any experience based on its unusual content. So, um, here I would also like to show you some books that have been um, very influential uh, and are also quoted many times in the, in the article in general, so if you're interested to read about them, um, here's the list. And in the end, I'm also showing you the full and extensive list of all the PAGP articles that have been published in the 21st century, which are exactly nine. So that's, uh, <laughs> that's not a lot. <laughs> um, but they have all been uh, processed within uh, within the article that uh, that I wrote, and I'm also just below here. I'm including one additional article that is that doesn't fit into the category, but it is from 1997 from Thorsten Passi, uh, which he which is a beautiful uh, list of the entire research uh, done on psycholytic and psychedelic therapy research methods. Methods, and I can assure you that in this list, I have found over over 300 uh, PAGP articles alone, and that is basically excluding the individual experience. So there you will find also way more uh, on how this therapy was conducted in the 20th century. So thank you very much for your attention.